And now we're here for another Two Whatever's Way Up. I'm your host, Jesse. Today we have Seth. Hello. And back once again uh, from the West Coast, we have Josh Dysart returning. How are you, Josh? Hello, I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. <laughs> Today awesome. we're, talk- we're talking talking about a little movie that I didn't even know existed until Josh brought it up. <laughs> uh, you posted about this on Twitter, and I was like, that seems interesting. Let's talk about that. We're talking about Little Murders, directed by Alan Arkin, the late Alan Arkin, who just passed away. Uh, we figured we'd do a little bit of a retrospective analysis of this is the only feature he directed. Is that correct? That is not correct. There was another feature, which I would have to go on Letterboxd to, to get the name of, and there's a few, like, TV episodes and things, yeah. but this was his first hmm. feature, and yeah. certainly his. Mo- when you consider the cast and you consider um, <clears throat> the subject matter, I think his certainly his most ambitious feature that he directed. Mm. Yeah, this doesn't seem like a very commercial film. If I tried to describe what the plot of this film is or the premise, I would, <laughs> uh, I'd be very lost. Uh, so, Josh, when did you first see this film? Because I, I, we. Uh, we couldn't find a Blu-ray of this, but you found a version that you found online and you sent it to us and we all watched it. Although it is worth noting, I did also find it on YouTube. It is on so YouTube. <clears throat> it is on. There, there are versions on YouTube, yes. Yeah. So when did you first see this? So I think, I'm not entirely sure, the, the fog of a habitual movie user, but our uh, movie watcher, <laughs> but I think I saw this about around... 2005 or 2007 on Turner Classic Movies um, during their like late night underground sessions they do on the weekends where mm-hmm. they get they get quite obscure and quite interesting and you know so it was probably a Friday or a Saturday night and I was probably just really stoned out of my mind and it came on randomly and any Elliot Gould fan especially mm-hmm. when they see directed by Alan Arkin come up uh, yeah. is is gonna is gonna sit down and pay attention right an Elliot Gould movie you've never seen directed by Alan Arkin and uh and it did I I found it it profoundly blew me away I thought it was just incredibly um uh just uh just incredibly ambitious in what it's trying to do what it's trying to say and then later I found out you know who the writer is and we will talk about that soon but you know the, the writer is e- an incredibly famous cartoonist who worked with Will Eisner worked on the spirit uh wrote this play that this is based on very obviously it's a, a play turned into a movie mm. oh um, yeah. yeah and uh and even if you look at you know and I quickly discovered just researching the next day that as soon as you start to look at movies that even remotely sort of feel like this movie, you'll find that Little Murders predates them all. So even if it mm. doesn't feel fresh to you when you see it, because perhaps you have you see a little bit of its vibe in Network or Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie or, you know, what all these different movies that mm. sort of truck in this same uh, relentless surrealism, uh, which is is something, yeah. a, a phrase I'll probably use multiple times throughout this podcast, yeah. <laughs> is uh, 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 um, uh, you'll find that Little Murders does it first, gets there first. In in a way, it's an, no one talks about it, but um, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I call it sort of the the first shot or the vanguard um, of the of American surrealism <clears throat> in mm, cinema, yeah. as particularly in '60s and '70s cinema. Definitely American cynicism. I was watching this and I was in the middle of it and I was like, oh, this is totally for me. This feels very yes. cynical. <laughs> I was like, this is right up my alley. And yes. we're talking about films that are in, that were influenced <laughs> by this. I got vibes of, um, what was that Noah Baumbach movie that came out? White Noise that on Netflix. That movie White Noise on Netflix. I got vibes yeah, of that. I haven't seen it. I read the book, but I never saw the movie. I did not like the movie. <laughs> I hear bad things about it. Yes. It's very bad. Yeah, that's <laughs> 90, what I hear. A $90 million dollar flop. It's, it's very bad. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I got vibes of that. It's kind of like, it's very disjointed at times, but it's packing in tons of sociopolitical yes. themes. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seth, what did you think watching this? Okay. So I, I, I went in as cold as you can go. Like there, I know Alan Arkin, you know, like <laughs> Elliot Gold, you know, I've seen the oceans films. I'm, I'm like tangentially familiar. Um, I was gonna think Little Sunshine, Miss Little Miss Sunshine. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, Little Miss Sunshine. Where is um, your grandfather in the trunk of our car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so coming into this, I'm super cold. 
I have no idea what to expect. And when we get to, I guess, our first really surrealist bit through the wedding, and I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, you didn't. So when he meets the the when he meets his parents in law, like when he goes, that's really, I think, when the surrealism kicks into yeah. high gear. The family. See, see, I was I was honestly still mm. on board with so much that of that is just like an example family, of Seth. normal. Oh, dude, I had a weird <laughs> fucking family. No, yeah, I had a weird fucking family. Um, so yeah, all of that. I'm I'm like, oh yeah, these are caricatures. This is fun. This is cute. And then it hits the wedding, and I was like, amazing. Oh, let me. Let me resituate in my ch- in my chair here. Which Donald then, Sutherland, we have to say for people who haven't watched, Donald oh, Sutherland yeah, is right. the non-deist progressive preacher <laughs> at the wedding. Right, yeah. <laughs> fucking amazing. And you paid me two hundred fifty dollars to not use the deity's name in this service. <laughs> right. <laughs> I I was not expecting the back half. Like even even for that yes. much setup, I was like the back half just had me kind of giddy going like, I don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah. I have no idea what's going to happen next. What a great feeling. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what a great time. <laughs> nice, I, I'm really good. curious. Did, did you watch this with people? Is this something you talked about? How are you talking about this kind of movie? I feel like film discourse today is such a different animal than what it must have been like to talk about movies like this closer to when they were coming out. What was that like, Josh? Well, first of all, uh, and I was born the year this movie came out. So I have no idea what the discourse around no, this yeah, movie was yeah, like. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't mean specifically the, like, what was yes. it like the year that this came out? But like, what, what was it like to be talking about movies when you saw this? Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I saw this, at, I was, I was dating someone who uh, was, you know, perfectly content to st- to stay up late smoking pot and watching old movies with me at that time. So, um, you know, but it was, uh, it was one of those relationships. Well, you know, I won't get into that. Let's not get into that. <laughs> Let's just say that um, I don't know that I processed what I saw. I only know the emotional impact on, it had on me and that I felt like yeah. I had seen something that had something important to say but i really didn't do the work at that time mm. when i first saw it to, to unpack so this it. is a revisit movie yes. for you to so really fact, learn to love re-watching it precisely because jesse was like let's talk about it and i th- i thought well oh shit all i all i remember is vibing with it i have to like rewatch the movie <laughs> and oh um, hell yeah <laughs> uh so rewatching Did it feel it, like that- a different movie this time around no, it didn't. It felt like exactly the same. I felt like a different viewer. The movie felt oh, yeah. the same. But, um, you know, I think you should always, especially if you love a thing, a movie, uh, you should revisit it a decade later all the time. Like, um, yeah. because you, you've yeah. changed drastically. The movie, of course, is locked and frozen in time, but you've evolved and you've become. So I really um, love it now more than ever. There is definitely a thing that happens very often when I do my decade later rewatch where I swing wildly in either direction. If I sure, very often, sure. I uh, I'll watch something that I wasn't very moved by and I'll realize that it was because, you know, that great, like Bob Dylan lyric, right. I'm, I'm so much younger now. I was older then or whatever the fuck that that's like, I, I, I have more fun watching movies now. I'm like less critical in, in, in a kind of way. I'm still a critical son of a bitch, but I'm like way less critical in a certain way. And so with this movie, mm. watching it again, only solidified it's, it's, um, it's beauty. And I, I feel like I intellectually was able to unlock it, or at least I did the yeah. work maybe just because, you know, my own relationship to thinking about movies has changed greatly. Um, <clears throat> being on letterbox, being on podcasts like this, I've started to, I've started, and also just really, really starting to take my professional role as a storyteller t- seriously. I begin to really unpack things. So, mm. um, so I found this second viewing to be incredible. And I did watch this with my wife this time <clears throat> and she, she really enjoyed it. What was, what was that conversation like post film? Do you, do you talk about movies when you're done with them? Is that yeah? That you're... We do, we do. We uh, we you know, but we approach them intellectually very differently. And also, what we talk about after you know, this is probably true of everybody. When you first see a film, particularly one that has 
murky ambitions, right? I would say Little mm. Murders has murky ambitions. Like you're like, well, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't even like. It feels this... like a very scattershot film. Yeah, <laughs> but I don't think that it is. I think it's quite precise. Uh, but it does feel that way. I agree. Yeah. And um, so I think we just talked about like just. It, that's crazy this is so you know are you talking about the the darkness of it or whatever but i think there's something Mm -hmm. much deeper going on there where jules pfeiffer the writer of the play and the writer of the screenplay is really addressing his place in his time which is particularly the um the like new york city social hellscape of 1960 to 1975 and he's unpacking Mm -hmm. that and he's stacking it so there's like uh, there's the references to the systemic rise in violent crimes in New York City. And I actually have right. the stats on that. I looked it up. Um, uh, oh, coming with the numbers and the math. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. that's right. I'm not here to fuck around. And so in 1965, <laughs> in 1965, there were 58,802 instances of violent crime in New York City. Quite a bit for one year. Wow. By 1971, so six years later, there are 145,048 instances of violent crime. From 58,000 to 145,000 in six years. So now, look, what constitutes a violent crime and the social ills that surround that are open for a much larger discussion. Uh, sure, uh, sure. People in power you know, say what a violent crime is or, or the reasons for it. But the point is, is that violence was on the increase in New York city at, during this time in a way that um, is kind of in, impossible to fully understand. The movie also references the 1968 nine day garbage strike, right? If you'll remember, yeah. they talk about the oh, garbage yeah. strike in the movie. Okay. So this 68 uh, garbage strike was so intense that huge piles of garbage in the street were catching on fire. Buildings were catching on fire because they were next to these piles of garbage. It was an incredible health crisis at that time because it was garbage in the streets. And um, uh, the entire island of Manhattan like smelled like actual shit. You can find, if you go online, you can see people like references to people talking about this at the time. But even more mm. interesting to my mind is there was a generational boomer cycle in the rat population because of this. So in the same way that we got a boomer generational surge after World War II when all the all the uh, uh, GI boys came home and had a bunch of sex and, and, and we're still dealing with the economic realities of that, something similar happened with the rat population in New York City around this garbage strike in 1968. Um, they Whoa. were Because it was a rat total right so they just fucked and fucked and then uh the movie um also all the what feels very jarring i think to a modern audience certainly to me um all the references <clears throat> to homosexuality uh a yeah. lot of use of the f word not not the fuck word um uh right yeah you know <laughs> not the, f- the other one that we don't the, say uh, yeah. yeah but i i i really do feel that jules pfeiffer is trying to address and discuss the conservative blowback to the Stonewall riots of 69 mm. that happened. Wow. Um, and that's what he's, he's taught. So it's all coming. Oh, there's also all the brownouts and the blackouts and stuff. That's from yeah. like the 1965, yeah. you know, that big Northeast or blackout that occurred. And there, there was all these brownouts. So essentially Jules Pfeiffer is looking at New York city as a t- total dystopia. And he's packing it all into this one event. And he's saying like, um, how, what kind of a personal philosophy do you have to have to endure the chaos? And then where he eventually ends is in the uh, uh, an exploration of the of the conservative fascistic mind when it feels embattled. That's his like final resting place with that that yeah. great final speech um, that Gardena, the actor Gardena, has. Um, uh, so I think that's that's what he's doing, and he takes a. a a central character, Elliot Gould, and he says, okay, here's a nihilist, right? He, it, when, mm-hmm. when the movie begins, <clears throat> why feel or like why care about anything, right? If you, if you, um, if you hate a thing, you, you become subsumed by your hatred. If you hate the situation, the chaos around you, if you uh, love the chaos around you, you know, you're, you're subsumed by right, it. There's you'll... no real, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I was agreeing with you. <laughs> yes, true. And, uh, um, uh, uh, right, so he doesn't feel, and 
and then, if, but relentlessly he's pursued by love, right? He's by the love of a woman. And when he right. goes to see his parents, he sees that his parents are non-emotive, non-emotional beings. They're complete intellectualists, right? All they do is um, assess and survey and intellectually. And, and that makes him want, that makes him realize, first of all, how he became the, the nihilist or the non-feeler that he is. And he chooses love. And then he is immediately punished for it, immediately. Right. And the rest of the movie, the second half of the movie that you're talking about, Seth, is him cascading along with his with his conservative conservative in laws towards becoming a part of the chaos, which is the final scene, right? Like, like just you know, without having a spoiler here, just start shooting motherfuckers, you know, just, mm. just start, just join in. Like, that's what it means to feel. I, I didn't expect at the end of the movie where he becomes the punisher. <laughs> that was definitely weird. That was yeah. strange. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think, you know, the punisher is not that extreme, but still. Yeah. Yeah. But also it's not, it's not, it's not done for a moral justification. It's right? not because it's, it's not because fuck it. <laughs> Everyone's doing right. it. <laughs> Everybody, you'll be be a part of the chaos. It's your only thing that yeah. that you can do. And I think that Jules Pfeiffer ends up really un, unpacking the conservative mind. Frankly, um, mm. you know how you fe- how they feel embattled, how they how 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 they the whole speech at the end, right? Where he talks about how uncomfortable it is to live in an unsafe world. And we just yeah. want to be safe. We just want order. But then that, in that same speech, which all makes sense. And then in that same speech, he begins to crest into order for people who think like him, order for people yeah. who look like him, not order for the other. Right. And that we, we could, right. you know, um, and I think that's, that's where it's going. I mean, in a way it, it, it's prescient and it predicts the Reagan silent majority that'll happen nine years after this movie. It predicts the tea party. It predicts uh, the Trump era conservatism. And it's not even that it predicts it. It, it, it just sees what the conservative mind has always been and yeah. makes a, mm. and makes a prescient call on it. There's also I, a, a heavy dismantling of institutions within the film because yeah. th- this is, if you, this film came out in 1971, one year later, Watergate happens. Yes. which is mm-hmm. the ultimate display of your government doesn't give a shit, give a, give a shit about you. Like mm-hmm. they, they clearly st- tried to steal the, or election. they're like anti-democratic. Yeah, exactly. Anti-democratic. Yeah. yeah, clearly. And uh, there's that moment when Patsy's father says, I don't have to believe in God, but I believe in institutions. Meanwhile, yes. every right. institution yes. in, that's displayed in the film <laughs> is failing and collapsing. The church is in disarray. The police department is falling apart. Can't solve any crimes. Uh, you just, the entirety of New York is in absolute turmoil. Yeah. And he still says, I bet I still believe in the system. Why? Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the point of believing in the system when it's this broken? Trying to slide the cops five bucks when they're down on the boardwalk. Cause that's how much dude, like that's real. That's I've <laughs> seen it happen. That's a real thing. Yeah, man. I mean, Pfeiffer's going after closeted youth. Right. He's like, right. The, the oh, yeah. brother. he's going after independent feminism with the with the with the, the you know, the woman who like gives all her love to Gould. Right. She's an independent woman. But there's still this like, I need you to love me. I need you to. Right. He's going right. after progressive non de spirituality. Um, he goes after policemen oh. who are so wrapped up in their imaginary like conspiracy theories. I mean, he's really he's really he's he, he is like Elliot Gould in the window at the end of the film. He's just taking shots. And oh yeah and he's doing he, it like, beautifully he, are you offended his, by anything you'll be offended by something in this movie <laughs> <laughs> right his speech to the parents at the beginning is is all about being paid to make shitty art like yes. it's it's <laughs> yes. A, literally yes it's like hey yeah i, I got into this because i really loved it and then it got obfuscated from me and then all of a sudden i was getting paid to make shit and, yeah. and, take, and they're giving me awards for shit and it's like damn i, I how how analogous is that to just so many art fields right now? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It just it feels like turtles all the way down for every issue. It's like th- we've we, we've been dealing with that for like fifty years. Shit. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. 
There's even that moment when he goes into first person perspective when he's in the park. Yes. The last, I and love like, that. Literally a pile of shit on the ground. <laughs> he's he's got to yank away from it real quick. But and, oh, I'm only, not like that anymore. But it's like the only thing that's in focus, right? He can't yes. focus on it. Everything else is like out of focus except for this mound of shit on the ground. It's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing movie. <laughs> Oh, and man. shockingly good framing of shit too. Like you could see the colors and the textures <laughs> and like <laughs> that's how I feel talking about Marvel movies. Anyways, uh, Jesse, uh, this really feels like it has tickled your pickle. Yes. Um, what, is... what was your like? What was your like? Choo choo, motherfucker! I'm fully on board. Uh, yeah. Moment. Oh, the moment when Gould is kind of like, what? What's the point? Why should? Why should I feel like? Yes. I mean, maybe maybe I've just been consuming too much news recently because uh, I'm still part of IATSE 487 and um, working in film and TV, although I haven't worked on anything. I moved back from New York uh, recently because ran out of money and all the work shut down. Um, and then there, just today, SAG decided to go on strike. WGA is still on strike. And uh, a couple days ago... Um, there was a report from Deadline that said, oh, yeah, we're just going to wait out the writers until October until they start losing their homes. <clears throat> Basically telling the industry to fuck off. We're not we're not going to pay you anything. We're not going to give you the deal mm -hmm. you want. So it's and all the people in my union are kind of like, well, no, keep fighting. Keep fighting. Why? They just told you to fuck off. Like, I'm just at that point where I'm like, I just feel like, what's the point? So this mm -hmm. movie kind of like at this very moment, I'm kind of like I'm kind of like Elliot Gould. What's the point? Yes, but you know? Elliot Gould uh, changes his mind halfway through the movie, and he chooses yeah. love. And you see, and then he gets immediately up. punished for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just choose love. See, Jesse, Jesse watched the whole movie. Josh. I watched the <laughs> whole movie. The whole just Jesse will love. start shooting out of his house sooner than he goes out. <laughs> I, I live out in the small town. There's no nothing to shoot at, so and I don't right. want a gun. Uh, but yeah, I was just, I'm watching this and I'm just kind of like, I really do feel at that point, like this, just at this moment, it's just the right movie for me. Nice. So mm. good choice. Awesome. <laughs> good choice. I love it. It's interesting, right? Because we chose this movie to celebrate Alan Arkin's life, but I'm, yes. I'm not yes. sure Arkin has one great scene in it. And I'm not sure that Arkin's direction is, uh, it's obviously totally competent and yeah. and he gives he obviously makes his actors feel really comfortable because every performance in this movie is a banger like every yeah. single oh, yeah. actor is on point i mean i love the mom of the family she's mm. really brilliant um uh and so but really i think the stars of this movie are the performers and and jules pfeiffer's screenplay i mean that's really yeah. where the, the juice is so yeah. it's ironic visually it's visually it's fine it's, it gets it done. It's a movie it's based fun. on a play, you know. It's that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I, I would notice, like um, in the, some of the candlelight scenes, the the comedy is really what's carrying the the brownouts uh, yes. through. Because even some of the shots are like, uh, there's no light here. Like it's yeah. a little under <laughs> under yeah. shot. Like it's not. But it, it's not a movie that needs to look ultra sharp either. Like right. I'm not I'm not poking it like this as as if it's a giant issue. But you can definitely tell, like, you know. Yeah, it was a we low budget need, independent production. A good story and good performances. Yeah. 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 For like for yeah. like just over a million dollars. Pretty good. Not yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it it's not it wasn't trying to be in it. Because originally this was supposed to be directed by was it Sidney Lumet, I believe. Is that true? And I did not know that. I believe it was supposed to be Sidney Lumet and he ended up dropping out and Gould asked Arkin to do it. Uh-huh. So that's uh -huh. why uh -huh. Ghoul was a producer on this. So that's, right. that's, that explains it. So he's like, <clears throat> can you come in and just direct this? Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it, it occurs predominantly, not entirely. They do take, they go outside a few times, but it occurs mostly in interior in spaces yeah. and yeah, precisely. Yeah. So it doesn't, it feels like a play. Yeah. It doesn't need a lot. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, we've seen films based on plays, and sometimes they're successful. I mean, I know you weren't the biggest fan of The Whale. I liked it. Uh -huh. um, but uh, we need, then there's other times where films are based on plays, and they don't work out, like Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> like, Ooh. some don't work out. You know, it, it's, it depends on the direction of what your intent is. And if your intent is right. just to get the script translated to a visual medium on screen... This one does it more successfully than others. And you know, this, sure. no, this, yeah, absolutely. This predates network by like six years, right? But it's got a similar yeah. vibe where it's really just 
a series of monologues set up together mm -hmm. for each character um, in a way that uh, Network at its best is a series of monologues when it's being like its most interesting. And um, yeah. and yeah. that's, you know, and, and Network was a Patty Chayefsky script uh, and directed by Sidney LeMay. And, um, uh, and, and so I think in these, these kinds of, these kinds of films that you particularly saw throughout the seventies, the performances and the writing is all you really need, right? You, you need an yeah. actor who can sell it right. and you need words that are going to resonate and be timeless. Like I think the speech, I think many of the monologues in this film are timeless. And I think um, it goes without saying that the monologues and network remain completely on point to this day. So yeah, um, I think that's a huge, huge victory <clears throat> for a film that's, you know, made in 1971. Yeah, Gould's sure. monologue when he's uh, listening to the tape recording of his parents, basically saying, "Yeah, I don't wow. remember your child." Yes, I don't remember. It's like how it's like five minutes long, and it's like devastating. It's like, yeah, yes. this is why I'm such I'm so completely screwed as a person. Yes, During and a that is where I I think some of the filmmaking gets played up there too, because you don't even realize that uh, Jules is there. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. She's there uh, listening, and then her response is, what are you talking about? Or Patsy, about? yeah, yeah sorry, Patsy. Patsy, I said Jules. And, and she's just sitting in the chair, and finally he ends his monologue, and she's just like, what are you What are you talking about? It's like, yeah. that's her yeah. first response. It's like- You have no idea she's even in the room, so it just, yeah. it it feels like such a such a hollow monologue, <laughs> like, just like it's meant to be straight to the audience. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's a, a great adaptation of what it would feel like to, to see that in play form. You yes. know what I mean? Where they just have the, the spotlight on the actor doing the monologue in the middle and then the reveal of like, oh, this is part of a greater scene. And and then it, mm, wow, yeah. The way to end that scene. It's amazing. Uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, did, I didn't see anyone, that coming. <laughs> did anyone get a little hereditary feel? Like maybe hereditary was trying to do this with the long walk with the blood uh, the, the same thing. Oh that yeah, yeah. Fred Wolfhard does through the like his after the the death. I, I don't know. They just they feel like they occur at the same place in the plot and uh, kind of act in the same way to yes. spin our story. I don't know. I just I was I got a little hurt. I, I hadn't like, thought of that. That's Ari a really Aster, good call. Did you, did you feel a little little murdery when you were <laughs> murdering that child in your movie? <laughs> Um, and that, that, that Elliot Gould on the subway uh, after that Ooh. scene with, in, the, oh, yeah. in the bloody shirt is so good. It's so good. It's yeah. so New York. It's Having lived so in New York for five months, I can guarantee right now people will see the strangest shit on the subway and no Dude. one will comment on it. And <laughs> yeah. he passes by another guy that's gushing blood from <laughs> yeah, his head. Yeah, and it's yeah. Like, yeah, dude, you're you're so not a priority, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and also it just speaks to like just the chaos, just a city in chaos, an ant mound that's been kicked over. You know, that's New York City in this movie. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I just I also just rewatched The Joker recently. Jesse, you can plug your ears. It's okay. I've never um, seen it. <laughs> Well, and it's it's talking about <laughs> it's talking about the same kind of stuff. Like the the trash crisis is the backdrop mm -hmm. uh, within you know kind of a a violent chaotic New York City. Like I, the I love that you bring this up as kind of a um, a harbinger of what's to come for dark <laughs> you know <laughs> comedy <laughs> and things like. Come on, uh, <laughs> sorry, couldn't help it. <laughs> I, but but you can. I I just I love the you locked in on the way that this made you feel the first time, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what really carried you through. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think a lot of this is built on that kind of feeling over everything within the, the scene writing. You said you wanted to talk about um, Jules Pfeiffer's uh, writing here and what, the, what the deeper aspects are. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a struggle in there to kind of pit between like the, the more political aspects of what are trying to be talked about. And then just the deep, sad feelings here of like, my parents don't get me and they kind of failed me. And I'm feeling like shit about not even being able to feel like shit. I can't be like, what, what is, what is it at play underneath here? I think he's saying, um, I think he's saying politics is downstream of your emotional state. Yeah. I don't, I don't think in the end, he's not saying um, this is a movie about politics. He's saying, right. This is a movie about <clears throat> social economic chaos 
and and the politics comes out of the feeling of being embattled. So it's similar to my what I've always felt about film criticism, right? When you first see a film, you're having an emotional reaction to it. It's mm-hmm. it, you're you're you like it, you hate it, you you weep at it, you laugh at it, you you're completely nonplussed by it, you know, whatever. And it's not until you after you have that experience that you begin to find intellectual ways to justify whatever it was you were feeling. Oh, I hated it because of this, or I loved it because of this. But that's an that's a secondary act. That's an attempt to organize your thoughts in, in an attempt to understand what your emotional inner landscape is. And I think what this movie does so incredibly well is it says when you are um, emotionally um, beset on all sides by the chaos of a society that is indifferent. In uncaring, unfeeling, and in the process of extreme change, extreme chaotic change, um, the politics that pops out the other side is a product of that. So mm. when he brings home, sorry for the spoiler, when he brings home a gun and he adopts his conservative in-laws and they're like, you know what's going to make us feel better? Let's shoot the cop you bribed earlier. <laughs> you know, let's... Right. let's um, <laughs> That that they're 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 not really making a choice to be political. They're just yeah. in the chaos of their emotions and their feelings. And I think that's what Jules Pfeiffer is talking about. I think he's talking about how conservatism emerges out of times of trouble and duress and socioeconomic hardship. The problem is, of course, is and I think it's in the movie in a very subtle way. He's also saying that. Uh, uh, socioeconomic hardships also come from conservative politics. So you start to mm. enter into this, like this cycle, right? That, that it's a you, Sisyphean right. cycle that yeah. never seems to end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah. 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 When, when I, I think if there's one criticism I can level at the last five minutes, I do wish when they are shooting people in the street that <laughs> we saw through the barrel, I know that sounds malicious. <laughs> <laughs> why i know that, what do you, I just, why do you need that no because it just it does feel like it's too closed off at that point because when they say they killed the lieutenant was it lieutenant price was his name i believe the yeah, de- yeah. detective yeah. i wish that we need because they just say oh you shot him it's like it would have been nice to like see it this is like probably another aspect of the filmmaking that we're saying is like the filmmaking is fine but well, I that might have been budgetary as, as it might have been budgetary yeah. but i do think that we could have just seen something in something in the street but just but that maybe sounds, let's, that sounds horrible but i just that's the one thing i would say like you're mm, like could would, it be could hate. this movie be more like call of duty that's really what i need i think that um <laughs> <laughs> yes and the main character of call of duty 4 is is price there you go there you go <laughs> but uh, yeah that, that's my one thing i'm not saying like it needs to be like a video game i'm just saying it just to hammer home that sort of conservative opinion like this is their perspective literally their perspective I like, mean, it doesn't you know, matter who the target is just shoot something yeah i don't know i mean i can't speak to i probably haven't done enough research <laughs> before in this podcast i can't speak to why they made creative choices that they made whether they were pragmatic choices because of budget or they or or it was it or they literally chose not to show or they're not interested in showing the kind of violence that they're commenting on which is kind of i think creative restraint uh but i i you know it doesn't bother me if it's the choice the filmmakers made that i think the intent and the and the the i think the intent was transmitted to me and uh, uh you know i'm cool with it Maybe I'm too. Maybe I'm just very numb. <laughs> it, well, it would have been more cinematic. I, like I, I don't, I don't disagree. Yeah. It would have lined up with the the shot that they had earlier through the camera, uh, in the park. So like, I, yeah, that could I, be I, a parallel to it. That would have been a yeah. nice parallel. Like he's using a camera and seeing through that lens, and now he's using a gun, seeing through that lens. But let's hypothetically greenlight getting those shots. And, uh, <laughs> that'll really flush out. Fifty the years here. later, let's do the reshoots and add them Listen. to the movie. <laughs> Hey, they did it for Highlander <laughs> 2. <laughs> we'll use AI to fill in the shots. Oh, that we need. shut up. <laughs> no. Alan Arkin of a young Alan Arkin getting his head blown off. Uh, People will love it. I apologize. I, uh, I take it back. 
I take and, it and back. That, that too, like when uh, when Patsy gets shot, that whole sequence is like oh. out of nowhere. It is like they go in for the kiss and then boom, it is happening. Like there's nothing cinematic about it. It almost feels like lights out during the middle of the play. You well, know what I mean? Yeah, it is very 70s in that that sort of pull away so that you see the gunman, the completely unidentified gunman, you know, right. at the end of right. it. Right, right. Did um, anybody else get vibes of the conversation a little bit? That the uh, the Francis Ford Coppola film, the conversation. Anybody else get some vibes uh, of that sometimes? No, elaborate. Well, like when he's doing the when he's using the tape recorder with his with his family, and he's kind of sitting there just like sort of analyzing things, or even mm. that sequence where like the gun that you you have the uh, the zoom out and you see the gunmen firing through the window. It feels a bit like that. Maybe it's maybe it's just like osmosis. What are the mm-hmm. dates? What let's let's look up. I think the curiosity. conversation was. I think that was sixty eight. Want to say it was sixty eight? It was right after French Connection, I believe. I think. And and sometimes it's just a similarity. Oh, it was seventy four. Oh, this is before. Oh well. Another yeah. movie that is damn. Created wow. by Little Murders. Oh man! Wow. Okay, I take it back. Holy shit. Well, <laughs> I mean, I you know, I mean. You may have gotten that vibe totally, but this only speaks to my point at the top of the podcast. I feel like this movie, it's one of those things that influenced a lot of people, uh, it, but the general audience never s- sees it, never talks about it. Yeah, you know, it's yeah, got like 6,000 logs on Letterboxd or something. He, yeah. he tapped into a genre that just got fleshed out later, it feels yeah. like. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. That's I think, I mean, I, that's why I call it the spearhead of American surrealism in many ways. Um, not, not that the conversation is surrealist, but you know, there, the, um, there's just, I just think there's something very unique for its time happening here. Um, yeah. And I think it's interesting that a cartoonist wrote it because, uh, mm. you know, Jules Pfeiffer was a Pulitzer Prize winning writer, uh, uh, made cartoons for the New Yorker. Um, but if you Google his stuff and you look at it, you know, there's certain aspects about cartooning that lend itself to a surrealism in film mm. because cartooning has no motion and no sound. <clears throat> the way we move through time can be very, if you try to apply motion and sound, it can get very kind of discombobulated <clears throat> and disjointed and seems yeah, surreal. Right. And I think, I think that he, he had an advantage in being a cartoonist because he could create well, and- caricatures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, that totally tracks because I could see this as like a a four panel reoccurring comic strip of yeah. you know this like schlubby New York photographer guy <laughs> and he just get something uh, he'll put himself out he'll have an issue put himself out there and it goes horribly wrong yeah and yeah. it's a, and it's a reflection yeah. in New York I could see the whole comic and like I could see the thing in my there eye. is a comic that reminded me of you ever read the, the comic Wilson the Dan Close book Wilson yes of course yeah. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me a little bit of that. Movie's not great. It's it's it's, a, it's got nice moments, but it's not great. Um, but yeah, there, the, the the comic is pretty good. I recommend. There is it. no way Dan Klaus has not seen Little Murders. There's no way. There's oh, no yeah, way. It, it, this does feel like like you go back to um, a Velvet Glove uh, cast and Iron. Velvet, yeah, yeah. Or um, was it uh, is it Ghost World? Uh, yeah, a little bit of yeah. that in there. Like there's th- th- you can just see shades of this all over yeah. his work. Yeah. How does something like this get distributed back at that time? Is this like a word of mouth type thing? Is this something that would have gotten like, you know, trailers and previews? This is a 20th uh, Century Fox film. This was distributed yeah. by Fox. So they. But this is an old ass Fox logo, too. That O looks True. a little different on the boot up. You know what I mean? True. Yeah. And Fox is Fox is now Disney. So this will never get a re-release, unfortunately. Yeah. Um. um. I don't, I don't know the answer to your question, except, uh, like Jesse said, I mean, it was a major studio release. Um, but you know, look, we still had the exploitation market was, was going, you know, was going strong. Um, yeah. the, you know, there, there were still drive-ins. There were, there were lots and lots of midnight movie houses. I mean, I, I don't know how this movie did in its moment. I think, Probably not so well, uh, or no. or maybe there would have been more critical steam um, behind it now. But there certainly it wasn't certainly because the culture wasn't like 
prepared for it. You know what I mean? Like there were ways to mm-hmm. watch something like this. Um, it might have just been a little too early, but, you know, we did get some late 60s Jedorowski films, you know, hit the market. And like I said, the exploitation market was going strong. We had received yeah. America was, you know, embracing Italian horror uh, from the Giallo and, and stuff from this point. So there, there was a place for this kind of youth culture surrealism. <clears throat> and, and mm. cynicism and, co- and comedy or satire yeah um yeah. but I, I don't know why it it's so you know it's fascinating so I, um i was eating breakfast at like this french bistro in santa monica like 12 years ago with my now wife kelly <laughs> swish yes and a uh, swish i love the dad when he's like he's a swish <laughs> a swish uh, yeah no i meant i meant in the basketball <laughs> i know you did but I just reminded me of it. <laughs> And, that's uh, a different kind of swish yeah and uh i uh and i was sitting there eating with uh kelly and i heard a very very distinct and clear voice behind me that i'd heard all my life and i asked kelly without turning around is elliot gould behind me and she said uh yeah yeah he's the only other table in here he's hanging, he's there with a friend i was like okay 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 so i tried to keep it cool we meet a lot of famous People living in Los Angeles, I've even worked with some, been to their houses. I, I watched a, you know, I, I, I watched a famous rock star's dog shit on his floor once. You know, it's something that happens living in Los Angeles. But L.A. Gould is pretty special to me being a real fan mm. of 70s cinema. And um, so I did something I never do, which is when he got up to leave, I stood up and I stopped him. And what I said was, um, Mr. Gould, I think Little Murders is a masterpiece it's a fantastic film and he seemed a little dismissive uh Hmm. maybe because it didn't do so well at the when it was released and he said well jules pfeiffer is a genius that's what he said and i was like yeah 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 uh and then he said do you come here often and i was like no but i could i could come here all the time and kelly who read his tone realized he was asking if he needed to find another breakfast place like if i was gonna like like haunt him like show up there all the time so she's like no 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 we live in venice it's fine we just happen to be in the neighborhood for the day mr cool and he left but that's just a a way of of well one to name check a little bit but also just to say that like even when i tried to bring it up to him i was hoping i could get something from him about it you know and and he didn't he didn't emote a lot about it. Now, maybe that's just because sure. I'm a fucking stranger accosting him in a breakfast, you know, bistro. But, <laughs> um, well, and, and who knows what, like, what 1970s era feels like in his mind to go yeah, back to. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, like he, he had was, a whole life yeah. of his own uh, at that time. So no, he didn't. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a bad era for him to even want to revisit. I, I want to give anybody the benefit, especially like celebrities, give them the benefit of the doubt of like, all right, no, yeah, yeah. You've anything could have been happening at the era of this movie that I'm bringing up. That's a sore spot for you. That yeah. I would just never, because I'm just a happy little fan to see you. I, I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, you know, he was like the it boy of the seventies. He was like, the yeah, it boy. Like, Ellie yeah. Cool. Didn't um, Long Goodbye come out not too long after this? Yeah, let's look up the date on that. Hold on. Let me I want to say that was quick. 75, I want to say. Dude, this movie predates everything. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so Ellie Gould really makes his big, yeah, 73. Good, good. Yeah, there you go. But let's look up MASH, because that's really when Ellie Gould explodes. See, MASH is 70, <laughs> 1970. So this is like, yeah. this is you know, and that's got, of course, him with Donald Sutherland. That's why yeah. Donald Sutherland is in the film because Mash was yes. seventy. So, okay, that's why. Okay, and Gould He's like, is yeah, like, yeah, let's get film. my buddy Donald to come on in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so if I'm looking now at Gould's, you know, okay, so he had gotten, I, so he was in Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, and if I remember correctly, he was nominated for an Academy Award in that. That's 1969, and then Mash yeah. is huge. So this is the first. He, and he's in a whole bunch of movies after that that I don't, you know, I don't think made much of a splash after MASH. Um, so Little Murders is really uh, in this moment between MASH and The Long Goodbye. So from 1970 to 1973, where he doesn't have very many hits. Yeah. Uh, wow. And then. So he's, he was probably kind of like, eh, it's just another one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then after that, then you get like California Split, you get Nashville, yeah. 
you know, he starts to really become uh, like, you know, a, pr- a, a pretty well-known leading man at that point. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And then is he retired now? I believe he is retired at this point. I, I don't know. He's big. Oh, no, He's wasn't tall. he in? Wasn't he in Asteroid City? wasn't Wasn't he in Asteroid City just now? I think Was everyone he? is in Asteroid City. I think yeah. I think everybody. Every actor. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm yeah. I'm kind of over Wes Anderson. I'll wait till it's streaming. I don't know. I saw a French Dispatch. I liked it at the time. I tried. Oh, it's recently. terrible. I tried. I made it halfway through a second watch, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm done." Oh <laughs> I, made mis- I, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. The Timothy. The Timothy Chalamet thing is so oh. cynical about youth politics. I can't even stand it. He's like uh. the most. Uh, Wes Anderson is a, a like a secret fascist. He's like a <laughs> hidden secret fascist. You know he is. <laughs> like, um, I mean, yeah. he's definitely trying to uphold whiteness. We'll definitely yeah, give him that. Percent. Has there ever uh, been a uh, black person in any of his movies? Yeah, yeah, there, there's one. Uh, every, I'm being facetious. <laughs> yeah, there's one. Uh, it doesn't look like he's retired. It looks like he did a movie with Jonah Hill this year. Oh, <laughs> that's a bad name to be associated with right now. Oh, no. Oh, my God. He uh, came back movie. as Ruben for Ocean's 8. Is that real? What? Don't make me watch Ocean's 8. Oh, I mean, I'm not. Son. I'm not going to complain, dude. Isn't Rihanna in it? Like, I, I watch that all day. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> wow, he might have come back for Ocean's Eight. That's wild. I hear children screaming in the background. What's oh, happening? sorry, my window's open because it's a hot, hot summer day. <laughs> oh yeah, we do have a, a little heat advisory out here. It's an air advisory over here. It's nice and smoky Ooh. outside. Thanks, Canada. Flame Canada. <laughs> They're not a real country anyway. Uh, so little murders, Josh. Any any uh, any little tidbits? I I feel like sometimes we go through these movies like you clean a crab yes. and you're just trying to find the little <laughs> last piece of meat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and anything that pops out to you, just uh, worth mentioning that we haven't already talked about. I mean. Ooh, plays get remakes all the time. I'm yeah. I'm happy to play the little pitch game. Who would you uh Timothy oh, Chalamet in the lead? <laughs> I can't. Uh, oh no, you're I trying to make, you're trying to secretly get Josh to do a film rescue right now. You're trying to get No, him. I'm not no, no, no <laughs> film rescue. Just, I can't, uh, uh, I'm so bad at that game. I, I don't see me I think I, it's so of its moment and of its time. I don't know how yeah. you how you do it. I will say though, on the Timothy Chalamet front, um I never really got it. I'm a 51 year old, relatively straight man, never straight, mostly forward. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I never really got it, but I did see the, the, the kind of YA vampire movie. What the fuck was that called? Uh, raw Jesus, man. You know, since I got bones and all bones and all bones and all. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't care for it. Oh, I really liked it. And I understood. I, I like got, I got it. After that, like I understand, I was like, "Oh, okay, I see, I see, Timothy, Sh- I see, you know, I, you know, I, I fucking." I he get, he I looks like dick. every kid that skateboarded when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, isn't he supposed to be like? Isn't he like twenty five or something like that? He still I, looks like he's fifteen. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm face blind to the, like the medium length brown hair, <laughs> twink look. Like they all look the same to me. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I, I, I finally in that movie, and I think it's because it's kind of an un, unapologetically romantic young adult movie. I mean, that's kind of what I liked about it was it's not for me, you know, like I, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's not really, it's not for me. It's, it's for young people. And I, I like things <laughs> being for young people. And, um, is, is, is this what you mean by watching movies less critically? Yeah, probably. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, does it, I, does it, does it make you not ever want to watch Dune part two? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll probably watch Dune part two, but I'll probably it's three wait hours, 15 mm. minutes, man. <laughs> yeah, man. I'll wait till it's on HBO. I'll sit there on my go. couch. I'll start it at 8 PM. I'll get high out of my fucking mind. I won't remember a quarter of it. There you go. And, uh, I'll just phase out. You know, I recent I do that. That's my Villeneuve experience. I did that with the new Blade Runner film, which I finally, <laughs> finally got over the fact that there was a sequel, and engaged with it. And uh, you know, you just you just get on the couch and you get high. You get a movie. Could, I, you won't believe the shit that I've seen. Have you ever seen Park 
Lanes, you know what this is? Park Lanes is a um, <clears throat> a twelve hour movie, a real time documentary about a uh, about people who construct like bowling alley equipment in a factory. It's there's very little dialogue. I watched that whole movie, man. Or it's eight hours. Wow. I think it's a, it's a full work shift. This sounds like an Andy Warhol thing. Uh, it's it you know it post dates some of Andy Warhol's long experiments in film, but um. Huh. I, I quite liked it. I had it on all day while I worked, and uh, uh, and it really made me reminisce on what a work day is. And like, I was at home making mm. comic books, and they were like out in the cold walking to work. <laughs> like, I really made me. <laughs> sort of, it, I felt like you sort of. I sort of needed to see a real what, job. What what the yeah. nine to five experience is like. Yeah, yeah. I need I need to take the one day out of my life and like. Uh, like experience their their experience yeah <laughs> do you feel uh, good that you have the job that you have <laughs> yeah man my job is awesome. I <laughs> yeah there you go. i don't uh yeah it's it's worth being poor to do it yeah which is exactly the trade-off i made yeah we're well, going back to blade runner you're getting, you're getting two more sequels to blade runner you're getting the tv show uh, and you're getting you're getting a video game which is was it 2033 well video game i i is fine um yeah well and that's assuming you don't count all the short films they did uh in oh the yeah that's right film. they did all those so yeah yeah i probably won't watch the tv series uh we'll see i think it's like 2099 what? after the replicants rise up it's a giant war something like that Sweet. why is there no blade runner anime that's my question uh watch cyberpunk edge runners it's blade runner anime that's what i'm saying though like just, that that one that. did it's, well so it's just it's just Blade Runner. <laughs> I just want something to tonally different. You can even find Cyberpunk. Roy Batty's dead body in Cyberpunk on a rooftop, just sitting there as he's dead. You can even find his body. So there you go. Sweet. That's cool. Just call it a Blade Runner game. <laughs> Was that in one of the DLCs, or did that ship? With no, the it's in the original game? game. It's in the original game. It's on one of the rooftops and somewhere you can find. Yeah, it's like a little Easter egg. So they couldn't be arsed to pull together a decent game, but they could be arsed to Easter egg the <laughs> shit out of it. They did cool. fix it. It's it's actually playable now. It's actually okay. Now. That's what it's, people say. It's still not great. It's fine, you know. It's the no <laughs> it's... man's sky path to redemption. <laughs> right, right. G games are made in slow motion now. That's yeah, what it is. exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like building a car and driving it at the same time. It's getting exactly. out the shop. I swear. Listen, <laughs> yeah. the Lego Movie got away with it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, we're way off topic. So one thing I wanted to talk about real quick was yeah. uh, the physical media aspect of this film. Uh, this was a smaller movie. It's a lower lower budget. There, you said there's a Blu-ray that's been released by, what was the name of the company, Josh? What was Indicator. It Indicator, yeah. But um, it's still probably hard to find. That's something that's been bugging me recently. $11 with, uh, on Amazon. $11 on Amazon. And with regards to physical media and studios not wanting to release oh my God. physical media. What? I'm so sorry. A hundred dollars on Amazon. Please forgive yeah, me. I was gonna say <laughs> just go to YouTube. Just... Yeah, it's free on YouTube. There's a VHS yeah. tape you can buy. <laughs> Let me pull my VHS player out for thirty two ninety five. Yeah. Wow. Even oh, the DVD that's not a Blu-ray is selling right now for sixty two dollars. So that is pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. That that's something I wanted to bring up is that there's been a significant push away from physical media, and I don't like it. Um, yeah, yeah. We were talking about Dawn of the Dead a couple weeks ago, and the original Dawn of the Dead, because of rights issues, you can't get the original film on Blu-ray unless you get the ultimate edition, which is now long out of print. It goes for like mm. what is one hundred fifty dollars on eBay, something like that stuff. It's it's near impossible to find. I don't even think there is a Blu-ray; yeah. it's just a DVD set. But um, the fact that there are so many studios that are willing, like George Lucas, is notorious for this. Um, not wanting to release original versions of films. It really bothers me because this is part of film history. You can say that there are some films that don't, that aren't a part of film history. Like last year, we talked about the Tom Green film, Freddie Got Fingered. <laughs> Seth, remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I that love that That is one. absolutely a part of film history. Exactly. I love that movie. And there is no Blu-ray. The studio has buried it. And so it bothers me that studios are moving away from this and you have Max is now removing shows from its streaming service in order to not pay actors yeah. residual, selling off rights to other studios. And it's just downright deleting things two weeks after they've been uploaded. Yeah. What was that film that was on Disney Plus? Was it Crater? 
that yeah. uh yeah that was on disney plus for about seven weeks and they never did a digital release and they deleted it from disney plus and now you can never find the film anywhere they just gone like the film doesn't exist anymore it's 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 not illegal but it is highly highly unethical and it bothers oh, yeah. me that not there is no maintenance of this anymore and that's why i appreciate things like Shout Factory, Scream Factory, Vinegar Syndrome. That's why I appreciate companies like this because they're finding mm. things that otherwise would never be maintained. And I I wish that there was like an official like modern release of this in some in some capacity, even just another DVD set. But it's, I think you know, it's just it bothers me. You know, there's very few people to champion it. Jules Pfeiffer is still alive. Um, mm -hmm. Also, he wrote like Carnal Knowledge, by the way. He like wrote a bunch of cool movies. Um, mm. I don't know if you've ever seen Gar Carnal Knowledge with Art Garfunkel. It's awesome. I have not seen that, no. Uh, it's a really interesting film about toxic masculinity because you need more of that in your life. But, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, I don't that's, know. That's kind of weird. There's a nice, that's a nice companion piece with the end of this film and going into that film. Yes, like, yes, exactly. I get so, it, I get it. I don't know, you know, like who... Who would, who benefits from a movie like this, like being viable? Except, of course, I feel like uh, to you know to enlarge in your argument, Jesse. I feel like um, we're we're in a real danger of losing the the twentieth century's you know huge swaths of the twentieth century's main yeah. media expression, which is film. And certainly things like Criterion and Turner Classic Movies. I mean, I love what you said about Shout Factory. I totally agree. They're out there, uh, you know, they're out there like finding these, these um, low budget, forgotten by time movies. They're resurrecting them. They're protecting them. They're making sure they get full digital transfers. This is really, really important work. But the big mm. boys in this business were Turner, are Turner Classic Movies and yeah. Criterion. And Criterion right. is essentially funded <clears throat> by a separate tech company. I mean, Criterion, yeah. as far as I know, doesn't make any money at all. It's just a, it's just one of like the one decent tech bro in the world decided to, to pursue his passion for film. And Turner Classic Movies just got purchased, right? By a, by a billionaire who doesn't give a fuck, who, who has no right, yeah. regard for the history of 20th century cinema, um, which is the history of 20th century. So yeah. it's really a dark time i know they and i know that uh you know scorsese and pt anderson and spielberg they sort of forced their way into turner classic movies after the buy and now they're positioning themselves to protect the assets uh and that's amazing but we're in this system where very influential millionaires and billionaires have to give a shit for us to we you know we don't we don't have an actual institutional regard for this stuff mm. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's just on the whims of millionaires now. And, yeah. um, it's really, it's really scary. You know, I mean, I, I think to, you know, it's one thing, the 21st century's film history is spotty at best. And I don't even <clears throat> mean whether it's a good film or a bad film. These are subjective terms that don't matter. Yeah. I, I mean, in the, I mean, in the way that like, you know, it, Films you that know, could be considered like classics, like not even classics. Just what are the how? Are, why are they important to the culture? Yeah. And I don't mean because right. of their content, but like how were were they made in a certain way? Like, for instance, one could argue, regardless of what you think of the movies, that the Avatar films have a certain importance because there's there was a level of technological investment in them mm -hmm. that we can yeah. see as as a historical uh, stamp. In, in cinema, like the, the tech right. that was used for Avatar will continue to be used. That's a historical moment. We don't have a lot of those in the 21st century. We yeah. have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of, of technological um, dumbing down, like quality going down. So, you know, so that certain things can be cheaper to make. Uh, mm. The only real advancement in the 21st century that I could tell is um, the democratization of the tools, which is really important. The SLR camera, yeah, yeah. home video, being able to edit video on your, you know, um, Jafar Panahi gets to make films even though he's banned in Iran just because all mm -hmm. it needs is a little camera and he can run around and make movies. That's really important. Right. Those SLR tiny little movies need to be protected. But other than that, I don't give a fuck about the 21st century, quite frankly, but the 20th <laughs> century is it's all there. The movement from, you know, 
into talkies, from celluloid to film stock. From these are really important technological advances, and and yeah. and then the content of these films uh, are are undoubtedly the single greatest record of the way people lived, thought, imagined, and dreamed in the 20th century. And the 20th century might be one of the most important centuries in the history of the human species. So film is mm. integral to making that work, even if it's Blood Bay or <laughs> Little Murders or Cannibal right. Holocaust. These are important. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interrant I mean in my own special way. <laughs> in two years ago, when we did our uh, our best and rest of 2021, you said that you were very uh, inter interested in the where streaming was going uh, in, <laughs> in the future. How have things changed? <laughs> did I say that? That doesn't you sound did. like it. You did. Yeah, you said you were interested in how streaming was changing the market, and now things are not looking great. I mean, we have great things on streaming. I mean, while we have great TV shows like Barry, we also have garbage like The Idol, which I... Oh my god! Episode, I watched one episode and I bailed. <laughs> I was like, "I'm done." I kind uh. of, I mean, it's kind of always been. I I don't think the ratio of shit to quality, and again, these are so subjective. These terms, yeah. But I don't think that ratio has ever really changed. I think it's always been ninety five percent shit and five percent really interesting stuff. <laughs> um, but there's yeah, just I a was lot more yeah. it's just a bigger numbers game now because it's I, a lot more I, to right. I was mentioning this to seth and hope earlier this week i said that this year has been dog shit for film i'm sorry man i know that sounds really mean i mean i haven't been to the movies too much because there has, just hasn't been much i've wanted to see like i i've like we've had how many bigger movies and even smaller movies come out this year and it's, they're just kind of like either bad or eh you know i mean mm, yeah like you, you agree with me, Seth. This hasn't been a great year. No, yeah. I mean, we we have we have some some great highlights, but I the the I think the bad ones are like they're so making, big that they just overshadow everything. Yeah, like the I I I think that what feels different this year is that everything that is uh, tanking in in that way is kind of like tanking in epic huge ways like the flash is nothing but you can't talk about that movie without stepping in shit right yeah. like it's, it used to be that just movies were just bad Dwayne the Rock Johnson's making Hercules and it's like <laughs> it's a stinker but it doesn't matter because it's like it, it, people could go to the movies and have fun with it if you talk about it, it, it it'll just disappear into yeah. the vapor I mean now we're only halfway through the year I mean there is a lot of stuff that is coming out later this year that I do want to see Sure. Um, but yeah, it just it just feels like typically like throughout throughout each year, I mean, we typically have like two or three like solid films per month, maybe like even one a week that are pretty solid. But it feels like we're really struggling to find like a, just a consistency this year. I don't know mm. if maybe I'm just being cynical, but it really does feel like there hasn't been much that's been just of just good quality. But also, like no. you know, you sort of have to. Um, I'm I'm like clicking around on my my laptop here. <laughs> you sort of have to look outside of your, um, you know, look outside of American mainstream cinema, and I think sure. you'll find that there is a lot of interesting stuff being done. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's, you know, After Sun came out last year. There's the uh, there's like two Harakazo Koridi. I know I pronounced this wrong. Koridi, the uh, film, Japanese filmmaker that I really love, Korean filmmaker. Sorry, I'm fucking all over the place tonight. There's Past Lives came out, which is really good. Broker came out. Fallen Leaves. There's a lot of foreign cinema that's interesting, but we fixate on, you know, we fixate on these American mainstream big budget movies, and it's not where the juice is. Um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> so I, I I don't think it's any worse than ever. You just have to lean forward. You have to like look outside of the movies that are being marketed to you, and you have to find there's a, there's really amazing artists making really amazing work all the time. Um, but it doesn't always get delivered straight to your streaming device, or doesn't get sure. advertised at you. you yeah, know? I really I think, should. I really should get a fire stick so that way I can watch things outside of, you know, my normal streaming services. Mm. 
or just you know rip it all off the internet i i, I <laughs> You're like, anti-piracy, though. That's the thing, you know? I'm anti-piracy. Am I? I'm not sure that I am, honestly. I don't yeah. think I've ever made that that argument. I, I, I'm definitely... I, I think we're on, like, the third movie he shared with us from the, uh, <laughs> I the dregs of the internet. I think... That's, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that if, if it's a big-budget film from a major corporation, steal it. If, it, <laughs> uh, if it's a small-budget film and you can get access to it, by paying for it, pay for it. If it's a small mm. budget film and you can't get access to it by paying for it, steal it. That's kind of that's kind of where I, I land on all that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sound of logic. <laughs> and and also, if if people become a little bit, and I know it's hard, man. People have jobs and they don't. I'm very fortunate in that I sure. sit at a computer all day. But um, you know, if you you were talking about not being able to save <clears throat> the cinema of, of the 20th century and, and even the 21st century, which is crazy. We're only 20 years into it. And we're already losing media, yeah. right? But, um, which is insane. But, you know, I think that, um, sorry if you can hear my phone, but I think that uh, um, if, you know, there are things like the internet archive and there's just a lot of ways, like I can kind of see whatever I want to see. I think right. um, the, yeah. I can't remember the last time I wanted to see something, no matter how obscure, and I didn't ultimately find it. I think there was a Finnish fairy tale film from the '80s that I couldn't find at, uh, mm. earlier this year. So there is a way to do this. It, there is a community out there; they're doing it. Capitalism isn't servicing it, but internet, uh, you know, communism is. For lack of right. A better term. <laughs> no, yeah, internet communism can come to the rescue. I had yeah. one. A, a made-for-TV film from the 80s that I saw as a kid and remembered, like, clips of the plot, and I just kind of seeded it out into the different dregs of the internet where you can find your your comment boards and your message boards, and I was like, does anybody know what this is? I know there's a Baldwin in it. That's all I know. <laughs> it, it, the face is a Baldwin face, and lo and behold, it took, like, 10 years and I get a Gmail update that's like, hey, a message board you used to be on uh, just got a response. And I was like, oh, let me go check this out. Uh, and it's it's this internet communism. Somebody found it and researched and grabbed the movie and they were like, it's called Yesterday's Target. Uh-huh. I've updated <laughs> I've updated Wikipedia so you can find it now. Was, yeah. that, a St- was that a Stephen Baldwin film? Yes, it was. Yeah, yes, I, know it was. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. It was like a ripoff of the X Men, where uh, instead of Professor X being an old white man, he's a young black kid, and it's actually kind of cool. Amazing. Um, yeah. Well, you know, this- uh, so, so I, I, I want. So what? What I'm aiming for here is I want to leave our audience with something a little tangible. Like we, we've we've been wrapped on the knuckles for watching too much American movies now. <laughs> where should where should people go? Uh, to to find these like not uh, mainstream, not Wikipedia posted mm-hmm. movies, uh, Josh, like wh- like what is a what is a resource? What is something that if if somebody's listening and they're going, all right, I want to see these cool ass not on streaming movies. Uh, where do you go to look for that kind of stuff? Are you, are you like, you mentioned Letterbox earlier. Yeah. That's a, I know that's a, a huge resource right now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Is that is that the diving place? Is there any other well, certainly, Areas a little you recommend. leaping forward in, in uh, Letterboxd will will definitely unearth something you've never heard of. It won't take long, and it'll unearth something you've never heard of, and it might take some resources to find it, uh, but you can. And there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, online, you'll be able to there. Like I said, there's Internet Archive. There's a lot of different places um, and resources that you'll find if you start looking into it, but there's also communities. And one thing you, I don't want to turn this into an advertisement for Letterboxd, but it has really, really profoundly helped me find my communities, find the people who are interested in the kinds of films I'm interested in, and ultimately move conversations over to Discord where we can have really robust file trading and all these kinds of things. Now, this is, again, it's a very lean forward kind of process. And I understand that's hard for a a lot of people who, who have have really busy lives and come home tired and don't want to do all this. There's also some really, st- I mean, first of all, YouTube, <clears throat> I mean, as, as has been pointed out, little murders is on YouTube. YouTube is a great resource. There are a lot of movies on YouTube 
um, that have been sort of forgotten by capitalism yeah. uh, that thrive on YouTube. And, and, and I, I would argue they're some of the best movies you can watch. And also, mm. if you can afford it, it's a little bit, it's one of the more exp expensive streaming services. But I don't know how you love movies and don't have a Criterion subscription. I just don't yeah. know. I mean, it's yeah. literally the only important. And now that Turner Classic Movies is, has been subsumed by a millionaire who does not care about movies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you can, if you can't, I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's a little bit financially steep. So, you know, steal if you can't afford. But if you can afford, supporting Criterion is definitely a, a good step. And and, um, mm, yeah. and and it will also blow your world open if you're if you're into it, if you... If you're, if you think it's interesting to watch an Italian film, you know, uh, from the sixties when they were, they were still dealing with coming out of fascism. If you think it's interesting to watch, uh, you know, something from mainland China, these, it's going to open up your world so much. It's going to change the way you view things. It's going to, it's going to remind you of the universality of the human condition. <laughs> it's going to make you more caring, more loving. I mean, loving movies, uh, literally made me a better human being right but but it's not going to be mission impossible 13 or whatever it's gonna you know that movie is a that's a that's that's a politician of a movie that's a movie that wants to kiss every baby and shake every hand you know what i mean right, it's right. Not here. But you do you do get to see tom cruise jump off a mountain so you do get to see that i don't know <laughs> why when tom cruise does a real stunt it's not interesting to me why <laughs> okay so it it's the jackass phenomenon now. It's like <laughs> we we understand that Johnny Knoxville could die, and so we kind of don't want him to do it anymore. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, sure. yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I, I mean, I literally the greatest filmic experiences of my life are watching Jackie Chan hurl his body through space. <laughs> right, I mean, right. Why uh, why don't I get the same thrill? from watching Tom Cruise do it. I don't know if it's how they film it. Like it looks so shiny and, and, and ugly. They're very, know. they're very glossy. They're very glossy. I, yeah. yeah. They, I don't know if it's because it's Tom Cruise and I do not give a fuck if he gets hurt or not. I don't know why it's not thrilling to me, but, uh, um, but I do, I, I like your theory though, Seth. That's, that's well, okay. All right. All right. All right. What's your heist alternative then, Mr. Dysart? The, what, what, where, where would you turn to if you wanted to see a, a heist movie that falls into this undercurrent of film that we're talking about? Is that what is that what Mission Impossible? I guess so. I guess they're like heist movies. They have like Dude, I, they, they kind they're of definitely not. That. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely not Call of Duty, Call of Duty movies. Right, right. Not, yeah, I think from like the, I, I, the the fifth movie on, they're kind of like heist movies a little bit. They're, they're, I think they're all government. The first yeah, of one starts off the heist. What are you talking about, Jesse? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're right. Fuck, you're right. That is a heist movie. Shit, you're right. I mean, isn't he always hanging upside down with like laser sensors around him and shit? Is that yeah? Like they, they're just stealing from the government. Yeah, while uh, working for the government. Well, we're well, stalling so Dysart can think. I, well, what is the question? Like, where do I go for them, or like, what do I like? No, 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 an no. I, what's an alternative? Yeah, what's yeah. Throw us a title of uh, an alternative heist movie someone could check out. That's like. Off oh, this man. beaten path that we're talking about. If not Mission Impossible, I need my heist fix. Send me to another country's heist films, maybe. I, I don't know. I would have to. I would have to think about that. I, I'm. Not, I'm. I'm a little bit Johnny on the spot with that hmm. question. I don't know. Tweet I don't know. Let, let's. Is that? But is that? Let's think about what do people go to for Mission Impossible? They want like really stupid, big, over the top action. Which, okay, I like this approach. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, so I want, I want a stunt. I want, uh, yeah. I want like quippy characters. I, mm -hmm. I want like, I, I'm looking for like characters that uh, uh, see, like, kind of hold their. Mm, is that what people want out of Mission Impossible? Yeah, yeah. They're kind of looking for those like. They're not really emotionally driven. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah. The, the, there's nothing authentic about their the way they're experiencing the story itself, right? right. They're a little too superhuman to be phased by it all. They're like, yeah. They're like, well, you had to have Tom Cruise punching Superman. So, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, what is that a reference to? Henry Cavill was in fallout. The, the, 
he's the bad guy. So uh, the, the eighth. See, I'm one. not even the right the person to have this one. conversation. With. <laughs> but right, he does right. you know, hook through his eye and gets dragged off a cliff. That was kind of awesome. That does so, sound that dope. Really but I bet it doesn't look as cool as it makes it as it sound. That's my problem. It's very it's, CGI. Yeah, they it's, never it's look as CGI. cool. Like, yeah, if you tell me that you know that Cavell gets a hook in his eye and, and he's yanked off a cliff by the hook, I would watch that movie in a heartbeat. But I know you're trying to trick me. I know that it doesn't look cool. I know it looks yeah, stupid yeah, yeah. and glossy and lame. Because I'm if sure they, I'm sure you can find that clip on YouTube and you'll be like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. If they made that movie in Hong Kong in 1982, they would have <laughs> just hired a guy and taken out his eye. They would have just. Right. <laughs> and it's immoral and it's unethical and I would watch the shit out of it. <laughs> but I don't need to see CGI Cavill, you know, I don't need all that. Yeah. 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 Or you could watch the CGI Cavill in Justice League and get see his mustache digitally removed. <laughs> Uh, that's the 21st century stuff we can lose. That's the stuff we could lose. Oh, you There's don't know that. this story, do you? The rapid pass. Are you asking me? No, of course you I don't, don't know this story. Uh, so for, <laughs> they had to do reshoots on Justice League, and he was already shooting Fallout at the same time. Warner Brothers wanted him back, and they said, "Well, he has to shave his mustache." And Paramount was like, "Fuck you, no!" So they digitally put a mouth over top of Henry Cavill's face. For Joss Whedon's Joss Whedon's version of Justice League, I like that 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 was, was easier than shaving the mustache off and then putting on a fake mustache later. Mm-hmm. That the, the option well, was the internet proved that kids could do it better on TikTok. Yes, that that was the real outcome of all that. That was just like kids going like, "No, I could do that better in After Effects," and they're all better than. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I do have a I do have a recommendation for a kind of heist movie that has really amazing stunts that I actually really like. Okay. Okay. Run, Runaway Train. Yeah, that's a, a fun movie. You're based on a yeah. short solo so, screenplay. Uh, was it um uh Andre uh, Konchalovsky, I believe, was the director. <laughs> Directed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Solid film. It's it's one of the few really great movies that Canon made. <laughs> it is silly. It's silly. Oh, and yeah, it, it's it's yeah, it's it's absurd. It's, it's very absurd. It's silly, but I will say all the that characters. Train is, that, that train's going at high speed, man, the whole time. The the trains are awesome. As train porn, it's outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, train but, autism TikTok, we hear you, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah, they they're already on this. There's no way they're not on this trip already. <laughs> the, um, Maybe. Hey, they, we're uncovering stuff here. That's true. I, that's I've true. never seen Little Murders before. This is the beauty of having an older friend. But mm-hmm, I will right. say that. Um, but the character interactions in that movie are pretty fucking silly. That that director, he also did Shy People, which I recut. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's a recut of Shy People. In which I, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> in which I, I just chose my one favorite character and, and only focused on her and then made the rest of it like a like a nightmare visual point. But have you ever <laughs> have you ever been to fanedit.org? No. So it's like people will do recuts of films and TV shows and they'll upload them. Be like, hey, here's my version of this story. Oh, I want to. You didn't know this existed? This is a brilliant site. Yeah. I don't know anything about anything. Somebody recut all of the Obi-Wan TV show from six episodes down to two hours. And it's like 10,000 times better than the original show. It's like it's a genuinely good, like just Star Wars film in and of itself. It's it's better than the bloated six episodes that, that got released. Sweet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so Runaway Train is visually a delight. It's the characters are John Voight really I agree. I agree. Really, really, you have, yeah. he, scene munch is like a motherfucker. He's a real chewer boy. He really gnaws on the <laughs> bone of that thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh yeah. I don't know. Let's see. I, I know I'm trying to like I, I just I honestly I think that letterbox has completely destroyed my mind. Um I can't oh. I can't like access with my own mind anymore all the movies i've all had <laughs> just go to letterbox and see what i've watched so give me an hour and i'll give you my favorite <laughs> ice movies. right right yeah. there was a really good oh, but see i can't remember the, oh friends of eddie coyle um but it's not the same it's not what you're asking for i think in the end when i want stunts i i return to the period when uh, when there were real stunt men and women Mm -hmm. and that and they you know the 70s and the in the 80s 
those movies to me have, especially the ones coming out of Hong Kong, and there's definitely a cultural barrier there if you're not used to some of the comedy in Hong Kong movies and stuff, it might be hard to access mm. that. But the stuntage, no, they they ran faster, they jumped higher, they fell further, and they landed harder yeah. in Hong Kong than anywhere else in the world. And, and then anyone ever will again in the world because it was highly dubious and unethical the way they were making mm. their movies. So we shouldn't right. be doing that. But we do have an entire body of work now that we can go back to. And I would say if stunts is what you're looking for and you can get past the cultural barrier that uh, yeah. some of the Hong yeah. Kong films from the 80s and the 70s have, then you're going to see the greatest stunt work ever, ever, ever put on film. Unquestionably, mm. without a doubt. Now, quit being so good they have to show it to you like three times in a row. And why wouldn't you want to watch it three times from different angles? <laughs> right. I mean, it adds that impact. Boom, boom, and that, boom. Yeah, and that's why I don't know why I get such a thrill watching Jackie Chan hang from the bottom of a helicopter, like five hundred feet above a, above a city. But I don't get the same thrill watching Tom Cruise hanging off a jet while it takes off. I don't know what I'm missing there because I know that's really Tom Cruise. I know it's, you know, they got the camera all up in his face and shit to make sure we know it's him. And they're um, both right. safety the same way. They both probably have a safety wire on. So yeah, it's... sure. But it's still incredibly insane thing to do. I mean, it's, uh, I don't, so I, I, I'm not even suggesting that. Is it knowing that if, Mission Impossible fails in real life in the stunt. There are like insurances and lawyers and things to fluff all that. <laughs> There's a that backup would plan. Be, that would not be the case in a Jackie Chan yeah. film. That it would be like just tank the entire company. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's I a real stake. Yeah. We'll, put the AI, we'll put the AI generated Tom Cruise throughout the rest of the movie to fill in for the fact that he's dead. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, he's already signed those rights away. You yeah. Know, so some of it might be the safety issues. Like um, there is no doubt that Tom Cruise is safer doing those stunts. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Than, than mm -hmm. the Hong Kong stunt people or even, you know, like, I mean, I think, you know, great stunts. I know I'm, I'm avoiding all the other aspects of your question, like heist movies and all that stuff. I, I don't have the same affinity for heist movies. So the people have some probably the wrong person to ask that question of, but I do love stunts. And I yeah. think that, um, uh, and I think that the tradition of the stunt artist is one of the most interesting traditions in film history, going all the way back to Buster Keaton. And, uh, and, and so I, I just don't think there's very much personality to those Tom Cruise stunts. I think maybe sure. that's it. There's something missing. Well, and what, wasn't it kind of gimmicky too, that it was like, oh, he was this serious actor yeah. and we're going to do the stunt for real because he's not a stunt man. But now it's like, He's a stuntman. Yeah, he's a professional stunt. Yeah, yeah. now yeah. every actor, every actor does yeah, their own no. stunts. I mean, like it's like no like, work pony. You know what I mean? Like uh, go do yeah. it, bitch. Like, like and they John Wick, like go John Wick Four. There's that sequence where Keanu Reeves falls down. Was it 200 steps of stairs in France? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you haven't seen John Wick Four yet. Um, but I have not. Um, uh, there's a sequence where he falls down 200 steps of stairs on his way up to uh, a church, and it's literally one. That's not how you get up to anything. <laughs> but it's he, he has to get there by sunrise or else a, a duel is forfeit whatever it doesn't matter but anyways it's literally one tired. continuous shot falling down two hundred steps of stairs and you can tell it's keanu reeves so it's like okay it's like yeah. he's a stunt man too so it's yeah. not special anymore i guess is what your problem is it's not it doesn't have like yeah, enough maybe. personality to it yeah or the and i i also think that it's all become very safe and look that's what we want i'm not i'm not I'm dangerously right. close to arguing for movies like being dangerous, <laughs> and I, I don't want that. You're arguing for snuff films, is what you're arguing for. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see that shit. That's <laughs> not what I want. That's not what I want. But you know, there's that great Werner Herzog line where he's like, There was a time in movies when if you saw something extraordinary, it meant that we did something extraordinary. And um uh and I I I I just have more fun i'm not longing for that to return i don't want people to be in danger for their lives but i have more fun watching movies when i know that stuntmen or special effects crews built something with their hands or there was literally an actual aspect of scale to the film uh that felt extraordinary and and i just 
don't feel that anymore. Maybe mm-hmm. I, I, maybe I don't see a lot of movies that would transmit that to me. I, it's not that I don't want to watch John Wick four or don't want to see Maverick or um, I'm, I mean, I'm more interested in those films than the Mission Impossible films. I do, but there's always something more interesting to me out there, like which you know goes back to which is why I pushed back a little bit on your point about there not being good movies. So there is always something I'd rather see than than John Wick Four, and so I never get around to John Wick Four. Um, uh, and yeah, so but I just don't feel the scale of it anymore somehow. Mm, like I do yeah. with like yeah. other films. <clears throat> And yet, and will, you, the, will you go see Barbie? <laughs> I fucking will go see Barbie. Yeah, I'm excited about Barbie. That's gonna be awesome. Uh, people are doing like double features with Barbie and Oppenheimer. I'm like, dude, uh, yeah, this is so. Yeah, weird. I think, I think that's gonna be my move too. Yeah, oh, man, I, I'm legitimately kind of getting excited for Oppenheimer. Like. Uh, don't you're gonna, it might you're be gonna good. trigger Josh. You're gonna no, trigger. you're not. No, I'm good. I'm being clean. You, you can you can like things. Yeah. <laughs> it is interesting. Listen, it is interesting seeing that massive awesome. that massive wheel of film that was it six hundred pounds of IMAX film, Seth, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's wild. That's yeah. just oh my god. Well, you wanted something extraordinary. That's extraordinary. I know. You yeah. asked for it. They delivered it. That's I know. I'm inconsistent with my my. <laughs> opinions, I know. Although, have you have you guys heard about IMAX Gate? No. <laughs> what is this? So, so, so people are finally figuring out that not all IMAX theaters are created equal. Uh huh. Because uh, apparently, Oppenheimer's shot um, chunks in uh, certain aspect ratios that only legitimate like. IMAX uh, distributors with like certain technical capabilities will be able to display. Uh And if you're going up the street to like your local IMAX, you're not actually getting the full experience. And uh, I just, I it's, I find it funny. I just find it a little cute. Like you said, That's Seth, all. I can't wait to watch Oppenheimer on the back of an airplane television screen. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. the way Chris Nolan intended. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. in 4.3 on my iPad while I lay in bed. <laughs> That's the goal. And it's because they made the AirPods so nice. I have the new AirPods, <laughs> and they're noise-canceling, and it's it's spatial sound. So if you turn your head, it's it like moves. Listen. Awesome. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll probably watch it on, you know, on my if I watch it. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I want to give Nolan the benefit of the doubt, but I, I'm, I'm, I, I know I'm the one person in the world who doesn't enjoy Christopher Nolan films. But, um, I'll, but if I watch it, it's definitely going to be on my couch, like on my. Yeah. TV. There's no why. Well, I'm not going to go to a movie theater to watch it. Certainly not yeah. going to go to an IMAX to watch it. We have to. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, don't I you don't. want to see that nuclear explosion? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I know what one looks like. I mean, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want, but, but, but to almost wrap, we're, but we've gone an hour and a half. I wanted to wrap right, up a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Um, one last thing. You were mentioned that um, uh, a, it was a cartoonist that was the writer for Jules Little Pfeiffer. Murders. To bring this background, Chris mm-hmm. Pfeiffer. Jules. Has, Jules Pfeiffer. Jules Pfeiffer. Um, in terms of production for a film like storyboarding or even like script writing i can only think of two other instances where an actual cartoonist or comics writer has actually directly influenced a film like that or maybe no three one would be frank miller sin city obviously two is brendan mccarthy with mad max fury road and three Mm -hmm. steve dillon the late steve dillon who's sadly not with us anymore did the storyboards for the uh ill-fated canon film supergirl (laughs) Sweet. Oh wow. The one he that did those. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys knew that. But he did the the storyboards for the uh the film Supergirl with Helen Slater. Um huh. can you guys think of anything else that uh, were an actual like comic well, or also, cartoonist actually you know done anything like that? I actually I'm and, and I think this is a very separate example from that. In all of those situations, <laughs> the cartoonist or comic book artist was visually, you know, uh, like creating the the visual tone tonage of the movie for lack of a better mm-hmm. And I and with Pfeiffer, it's it's just the written word. So, okay. so so his cartooning 
maybe in a spiritual spiritual way impacts the movie, but there's but he's not he's not storyboarding it. He's not, it's a play. You know, he wrote a play. Yeah, right, looks yeah. like you read it on the page, which I've, I've I've tracked it down. The play on the online, and it, it's it's a play. It's just words. You know, it's so it's it, it's a little bit disingenuous to to com- to put him in that that bucket of films like that. Uh, that is also, true. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to push back a little bit on the McCarthy Fury Road thing because while he certainly was involved in production, and there is a lot of his ideas particularly in the production design. I'm not sure he storyboarded that movie. Is that true? Really? I true. Yeah. I, I thought, I'm he, not, I thought he did. Wrong. Maybe I'm I wrong. Interesting. I, 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 I read that book. Was it uh, Blood, Sweat, and Chrome about the history of oh, Fury Road? Well, you know more about it than I do. Well, <clears> yeah. It, 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 that is a book that's right up your alley. You should definitely read yeah. that. It's a very it's fascinating read about the production history of that film. I think he did actually storyboard that entire film and they had it all like laid out in storyboards all around an entire room. Like here's the whole movie and it was everything. So I think that he actually did do the storyboarding on that. He was on board right from the get go. Uh, McCarthy's like 2000- work on Mad Max four started more than a decade ago. Yeah. He produced thousands of drawings uh, for its storyboard mm-hmm. and the cover for an early idea to make it a graphic novel. But wasn't yeah. he off that production like years before they started shooting? Or am I wrong? Uh, no, as far as I'm aware, because he they because they it had halted production like three times because yeah, well, I knew the, that yeah yeah, yeah. It, the slow motion production like uh, uh also turned out a video game yes that like which was quite good had, it is yeah. good well and and it. And it had a lot of influence from Fury Road specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, that that was like a big part of the. the it, it, so it's kind of like it's supposed to be a probably hard to tell. That? Yeah, it's 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 probably hard yeah. to tell how much he was involved across that period. But it from uh, from what I understood in the book, he was like it was him and Miller early on going like this is what we want to lock in the visual of whatever we're doing next whenever we get to be able to do it. So it's like, it's like they, they kind of established that look and held that across the, the grind of every like restart that they would do. Rock on. Yeah. Speaking of well, movies, I actually which, do like, want to see this year. I do want to see that. <laughs> what? Oh yeah. Furiosa. <clears throat> Furiosa. Oh, that this year? It should be. I think it's supposed to be like November or December or something like that. I mean, uh, look, you know, I, 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 uh, as you well know, I, Mad Max is more important to me than Star Wars. I, I think that, um, right. but it is a little, uh, now I'm like a little nervous because he, you know, they took decades Brothers. to make, no, no, they, no, Miller himself, whom I love and adore, but you know, it, it took him decades to pull together Fury Road and it, and decades is a long time to process create reevaluate restructure um it's been a much shorter production time for furiosa and i hope not true not true okay okay re- tell me all, all three scripts fury road furiosa and the wasteland were all written before they even started production on on fury road that's in the book okay. they're all done they're awesome. also good so they're, they, they've already had everything planned out like the wasteland is supposed to be the last one and then it's gonna then he's walking away then he's retiring all right. Awesome. Well, so, good. At least that's I if Warner good. Brothers doesn't, if Warner Brothers lets him do it at this point, because yeah. we have an asshole in charge of Warner Brothers at this point. Right. Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I, I mean, I've never seen a bad Mad Max movie. And, and, I agree. and fuck you about the <laughs> Unbelievable. We thought it was awesome. good. We said it was good. It just, we had yeah. some issues with it. No, not acceptable. Not acceptable. God damn it. <laughs> Jesus. Says the guy with a, a, his own fan edit of something. <laughs> Wow. Wow, Josh. I, I did think of a movie the other day that you would actually be, that you would actually might want to do a film rescue of. It's a movie you hate. It's not I Batman, I swear. What it's is it? Ferris Bueller's Day Off, because I know you hate that movie so much. Find a See, way I to would just, make, I find would a way just to make Ferris interested. actually pay for his crimes by the end of the movie, make him not an yeah. asshole. Or just uh, what if he's just an ethical person who cares for his friends throughout the whole movie? It does change things drastically. Like then, yes. there's, like, yeah. there's like no, uh, the, yeah. <laughs> there's no forward push to the plot if he's not. If he's not a dick. Yeah. <laughs> no push to the plot. <laughs> That's a I no. If he's not that, a dick. Mo- that movie should end with the principal like shooting, like committing suicide. <laughs> 
because of the <laughs> oh my god Avengers. that would be great you know what? that's my film that's my film rescue take on this don't make ferris bueller a better person make the consequences of his actions on the other people way way more horrible <laughs> so that he's just a wow. fucking narcissist just leaving bodies in his wake that's how you Damn. Make it. there you go it's done we did it <laughs> cut this part out and call it film rescue <laughs> <laughs> Today on your Ferris Bueller micro rescue. <laughs> oh, oh God! Well, no, I, honestly, a dark twist to that sounds great. Uh, it always makes me think about that ending we almost got to Clerks, where he gets shot. Oh yeah, <laughs> I wish. I, I kind of like it. I don't know. <laughs> but if you have that ending, you don't get the rest of the Viewisk universe. You don't get the rest of it. Oh no! What That's would true. we do? What would we have hey. done? <laughs> we don't. We don't <laughs> dogma. Speaking now, of now movies wait. you can't find anymore. Red State. Red oh, my God. You can't find them anymore, damn it. Isn't Red State like five years old or something? Did it just come out? It was, like wasn't it Weinstein's eight. company? Uh, uh, because he didn't want... Uh, Kevin Smith didn't want Harvey Weinstein to get any money from the profits, and because they couldn't find an agreement, they just can't after he re-released. profited from Weinstein for decades and decades. Now he's. Like, yeah, I'm guessing he didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm guessing that as well. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to go there. That's that's a whole other Listen, debate. <laughs> I'm not going to. The, the point. The the point of this episode was check out Little Murders. <laughs> First of all, uh, second of all, if you like movies like this that you've never heard of that are awesome, you should investigate Letterboxd and get into Discord communities and maybe check out fanedit.org and maybe check out Internet Archive. And Criterion uh, Collection. <clears throat> Criterion Collection is a must. Go do your homework, kids. You like movies. Yeah. You said you liked them, so you got to eat your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> The perfect uh, encaps- the perfect encapsulation to the American film system right now. There was a photo that got leaked from the Deadpool three set, and it's an image of the 20th Century Fox logo crumbled into the ground. You nice. know, we we should cut from <laughs> the the Little Murders 20th 20th Century Fox <laughs> with the wonky O next to the Deadpool one that's all messed up, and it's that's like amazing. this is your legacy. Welcome to twenty. No twenty first century Fox. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's the perfect way to end the episode. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah. Josh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I love coming on. I'm, well, I miss doing our year end uh, thing for last year, but I know it's because well, you guys didn't want me on because I hate everything. And, I, and that's, that's what I told him. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was like. We, we would like prefer the, if you weren't like here. Out of the country or something like that, or something. I don't know. No, I haven't left the country since the pandemic. Sadly. Uh, no, yeah, I uh, I wasn't there for that one either. So we'll we'll readjourn in five months. How about that? You come back with your <laughs> heist awesome. movie in your list. <laughs> I expect I the heist I'll do my movie. Homework. I will. You better blow our socks off. Too. <laughs> I will. I'm gonna make a list of heist movies. Fuck yeah! You'll have it in your inbox by tomorrow. I got. Uh, I'll yeah. do the work. Let's let's bring this ship to shore. Yeah, How about that? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate this, Seth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. What a great watch. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm really jo- glad you guys enjoyed the movie. I was. I, uh, you never know. You never know. Yeah. I needed a little <laughs> cynicism in my diet now that uh, the entire film industry is at an absolute standstill. <laughs> Here's to piss in your Cheerios. Yeah. I literally yeah. got this morning a uh, an email from my union saying, yeah, we're at an absolute standstill. We're going to put together a care package for anybody that can't find work. I'm like, thank so, you. So <laughs> uh, uh, you're going to be able to, I mean, we don't need to do this on the podcast, but maybe it's interesting to people, but uh, you're going to, obviously you're going to be able to go on an unemployment uh, I do mainly like corporate stage jam work at this point. Like I got back, I came back from New York in February um, or no, in March. And I came back with a hundred dollars. Mm, my brother, I'm <laughs> I sorry. lost. Yeah. I lost all my money because everything fell apart. Uh, the industry basically shut down because of the winter. And then yeah. uh, they were basically already in the talks of doing a strike. So I tried getting on fallout. Couldn't get on fallout. Try getting on the new daredevil yeah. show. Couldn't get on daredevil. And uh, I basically just said, screw it, I'm leaving. Came back, started doing corporate stage chain work. I worked almost nonstop from like middle of March until end of May. 
and I paid off all my debts. I had to borrow money from my mother to pay my rent one month and I paid her back. Hooray so I'm mom. back home. So yeah. And I'm back home. I moved all my furniture down to my basement. Uh, so yeah, I'm back here again, which is nice because I don't have to pay $1,400 for a room the size of a prison cell. <laughs> <laughs> because It looks a little like a prison cell though, from what I can see. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> <laughs> It's There's pretty more nice to the back room. here. And, and all the bookshelves are in the other room. I have like eight of them. So, yeah. Well, so, yeah. if this is actually a hostage video, give us some sign. Blink in Morse right. code or something. Blink blink twice. Yeah. <laughs> so. But uh but yeah, uh, I'm mainly doing corporate stage and stuff. It's it's my bread and butter at this point, which I'm fine with. Mm. Yeah. So, we have a union meeting on Sunday just to figure out what the hell anybody's going to do. So, well, I'm glad yeah. you got something to fall back on. Yeah, definitely. Hell yeah. Um, but uh, Josh, with you, what do you have coming on right now? What do you have coming up in in developments at this point? Uh, I can't really talk about anything yet, but uh, there's a lot of really, really great stuff happening. Um, <laughs> but what I will do is just promote old work in case anyone has actually made it an hour and 42 minutes into this podcast and not heard me talk about this shit before. But um from Bad Idea Comics, I've got Odin's Eye and Orc Island. Both are very, very different takes on fantasy, uh, and um, I'm really proud of them. Um, Orc Island, if you're an anti-capitalist, then Orc Island's the book for you. <laughs> and if you're really interested in the way human stories migrate and get told, then Odin's Island. Uh, Odin's Island. Um, <laughs> Odin's Eye one. is a story for you. Um, but really, the best way to support me is is if you want to check out my novella, my 100-page novel. It's called Brood X. It's $5 digital, $9 if you want an actual physical copy. I'm really, really, really proud of it, and I'm working on my second novel now. And uh, in my graphic novel, uh, Good Night Paradise, which is a murder mystery that takes place in the homeless community of Venice Beach, California, where I lived for 20 years and was actively involved in the homeless community there. And uh, so that's what I have. But I do have big news. I just can't announce it yet. I'm really excited to tell everyone. Can't wait. Yeah. Any, where will you announce the big news when it gets to next? Uh, uh, I will announce it on my Twitter, uh, where I am. Uh, I have cut back considerably since the management of Twitter <laughs> has become fascist assholes but um but i'm pretty much the place to be now apparently (laughs) um but i'm pretty much i I don't know if i I don't know if zuckerberg is my answer to elon musk what are uh, the options (laughs) i know exactly but um but yeah but i'll i'll promote on twitter i'll promote on facebook too i'm very rarely on facebook unless i have something to promote uh you can always find me on letterboxd uh habitual user there and um yeah that's where that's where i that's where i tell the world my news uh, now I have to ask this one question because I just it just popped on my feed earlier today because I saw Camilla Sweet. post about going to San Diego. Uh, Helmet Girls is that like dead? okay? <laughs> so Helmet Girls, um, I want to be careful and not say anything about Camilla's participation in it. That's her business and that's her her story to tell. I wrote in twenty nineteen. Uh, I wrote a 200 page graphic novel. We went through all the notes with Camilla. We then got a contract from 10 speed press, which I believe is a subsidiary of random house. Um, and I, and because I could, and I was able to, and because I knew that Camilla was going to have a much bigger workload on her hands, I, I didn't take any of the advance money on that. And we were supposed to, we had a lot of like tight deadlines, but then the, the pandemic really took hold. And then there were some other issues in Camilla's life that is her business and her story to tell. And suffice to say, we are, we are no closer to um, a helmet girls graphic novel now, to my knowledge than we were when I finished writing the script. Um, I, I haven't said this publicly. Uh, I'm, there's a, we can cut this if you want to cut this. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a possibility that I, I could, we could do it as a prose young adult novel and we could, instead of making it a full graphic novel, Camilla could do the much less labor intensive work of just doing lots of beautiful illustrations for the book, you know, big double page spreads, spot illustrations, opposing page illustrations, and just make a really beautiful big hardback 
artifact of a book and that might be the answer. Um, I proposed that to her at the beginning of this year and she responded pretty well to it, but then I've just gotten so busy, um, with my bad idea work, uh, that I haven't gotten to go back to that, but it's sort of my intention to reach out to 10 speed press and see if they would be interested in that. Cause we're way behind. I mean, we have we've completely yeah. blown through all of our, our deadlines. So, um, yeah, that's where, that's where helmet girls. And I appreciate you asking about it, Jesse. You're like the only human being on the planet who still knows. That actually still knows. <laughs> that still thinks that, that, yeah, that, that this is still a project. Um, Cause you know, as you, I mean, as you know, we've been talking about it since like fucking 2007 or something. So. Wow. Um, I mean, it, yeah. it, you know, it, it happens like pro- projects come and go. I mean, you were working on a Marvel thing for a while and that disappeared. Oh my God. I was working on a, I mean, there was a whole other podcast yeah. is, is a, the, we yeah. could do an hour and a half on, on projects that failed. But I, I, that Marvel project was Captain America in Vietnam that Jody LaHoop and I uh, oh, wow. were, were, um, were building. And it took us like a year to get it to a place where Marvel greenlit it. Cause Marvel mm. was so cautious about it. And I was also like, you know, um, if I was going to do that story, it had to be, it had, had to be something I, I politically felt comfortable doing. Right. So yeah. I wasn't going to mm. like turn Vietnam into an adventure, like adventure war yeah. story. And, um, right. But we finally found a kind of weird Venn diagram where Marvel's interests and my interests met at that time. And then it, and, and that fell through in a very storied way mm. after yeah. a year of production. So it was one of movie, movie stuff movies. took over. So. Uh, yeah, actually, I think uh, I don't really know what happened there, actually, to be frank. They cut like a lot of titles. Um, yeah. At, that when they mm. cut my title, it was one of many. So I don't think it was personal. Yeah. Uh, they would cut. They would cut that, but they would republish. Was it that book, Ruins? The uh, Warren Ellis book, Ruins, where Captain America is a cannibal in World War Two. Sweet. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that book. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what their reasoning or politics behind it are. I, I think that uh, you know, it's the height of hubris to yeah. assume that Pete that there's a conspiracy against you. <laughs> but, uh, uh, hey. But uh, I, I have some pretty, I have it on pretty good authority that uh, some very powerful people at Marvel uh, um, don't like me. So it's okay. I mean, all that, I just means I've done, I've done things right. And who wants to work for Marvel right. anyway, man? It's a weird culture over there. I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> eh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on which writer you are. I mean, if you're, if you're. Uh, I mean, it, some writers work well with bigger companies. Like Tom King has been doing some great stuff with the DC universe recently. His his book was it Supergirl got nominated for a Hugo recently. It's phenomenal. Isn't he's he the ex CIA agent? Uh, yes, he's ex CIA. Cool. Yeah, he goes the cool. third eye actually. Yeah. Oh, um, cool. And uh, <laughs> he's a nice guy. I met him. No, he is. I met him. He is a nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, or like Garth Ennis with the Punisher. You know, he knows how to make that character work. We did they cancel. They did cancel one of his Punisher books after the January sixth incident. They did cancel one of his books. <laughs> I did see that. I do love me some Garth Ennis. I will say something yeah. um, about Tom King. I, I I have met him. He's he's very nice. But one night we were talking in San Diego, and it turned out that we had been in uh, the same parts of Iraq uh, for very different mm-hmm. reasons. Him uh, in a capacity he could not talk about and me uh working for the world food program a nobel peace prize winning organization that moves without guns through war zones so i just want to emphasize yeah. here if you just to highlight no offense mr king uh but one of us is part of the industrial military complex and the other is part of the humanitarian aid complex so just keep that in mind kids when you're reading our oh story. man <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorical shots fired. <laughs> no, so, no, no, no. This is a political <laughs> movie episode. So no guys, we're hear. allowed to go here. <laughs> okay, we need to, we need to stop talking before we start engaging in like war crimes or something. <laughs> we got our plugs. We set our pieces. <laughs> yeah, we're out. We're That's out. We're out. out. Yeah. Okay, we're done. All right. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you for having me. All right.